Believe it or not, this is a Pokemon. In Generation 3, the Pokedex might stop at number 386, Deoxys, but there's actually room for an insane total of 65,536 possible species, and all of them exist as unique Pokemon. But, obviously, they lack in-game data for sprites, so they appear as these odd question marks, known as Decamarks. The vast majority are chaotic and unstable. Summoning one of these Pokemon and merely glimpsing its mysterious form can crash your game or brick your save. However, dedicated glitch hunters understood their potential, and on August 29th, 2020, everything changed when Merp submitted this tool-assisted speedrun of Japanese Emerald. Merp had found a Decamark that, when hatched, corrupted the game in just the right way to read the names of the PC boxes as functioning GBA code. In this case, teleporting directly to the Hall of Fame and completing the game in a mere 54 minutes and 54 seconds. This breakthrough was known as Arbitrary Code Execution, or ACE, and skipping to the end of the game was just a peek at what's possible. Want to pick another starter? Want to access Muse Island? What about the famously rare Mirage Island? Just force it to appear, and for kicks, make Celebi spawn there 100% of the time. Thanks to the work of very smart people like Merp, Slipenir, Eshark, and Shao, all this and more can be done with any version of Emerald on real hardware or emulator in any language. And I'm about to teach you how, but first, if you've been subscribed for a while, you might be asking, didn't you already make a video on this? And if you aren't subscribed, you should go click the button. I'm trying to get to 50,000 by the end of the year, and your free click goes a long way with the algorithm. Anyway, yes, I did make a guide on setting up arbitrary code execution around a year ago. However, since then, both the capability and accessibility have improved. As I said before, this is possible on emeralds of any language. In fact, I just recently streamed the entire setup from scratch on my Japanese emerald live. I caught a shiny Mew with five perfect IVs and then used it to beat the Scarlet and Violet Mewtwo event. It was a fun stream, and this video will cover all that setup, highlighting the differences between Japanese and the Western languages. But if you want to watch the whole VOD, I'll put a link in the description and pinned comment. However, there's also the matter of 4OE9. In my original video, I covered how to generate an egg and then hatch it to execute the ace codes. This was limited in that you had to maintain a supply of eggs using cloning and go through the hatching process every time. But now? As you can see, this is no longer necessary, as Merp devised a way to use the glitch egg to create a more stable ace Pokemon that works anytime you open the summary screen. You can move it around in the boxes, put it in your party. It's great! Super convenient and lets you execute codes anytime, anywhere. One of the most common comments I got on the first video was, why not just use an action replay or game shark? Well, they're pretty expensive these days and the codes are different depending on which model you have. And they often fail. My childhood Game Shark doesn't even boot. But once you complete this guide and get a working Ace Pokemon, it's like having a Game Shark inside your game for free. And so let's begin. First and foremost, you need to have finished the story in Emerald and have access to the Battle Frontier. If you're playing on emulator, be aware, codes may not work exactly like on hardware. For best results, I recommend MGBA with a GBA BIOS enabled. You'll need to Google that for yourself. I'm not gonna get too deep into emulator stuff. Just know that it's possible. Additionally, I recommend backing up your save data if you have the tools for doing so, or at the very least, trading any precious Pokemon off the save file. There is some risk of getting locked, losing Pokemon, or losing your save. However, as long as you make sure never to save before verifying you've followed instructions and executed everything correctly, you should be safe from any of these meltdowns. There are lots of ways to back up your GBA saves to an SD card. I'll put some resources in the description and pin comment as well. Additionally, there are several great text-based guides and resources out there for this process. Those will all be down there too. We start by catching three Pokemon. A Ralt from Route 102, which we'll trade to this guy in Rustboro for a Dot, A Volbeat from Route 117, which we'll trade to this guy in Fortree for a Plusle. And a Shuppet from Mount Pyre, which will help us set up the glitch later on. If you've already done these trades on the save file, unfortunately you need to either trade them from another emerald or restart your save. Corruption on wild caught Pokemon is not easy to predict and control, 
but these trade Pokemon have fixed data, which makes the setup consistent. After which you should immediately take CDOT and Plusle to the battle tower. Do not battle with them, do not let them gain any EXP. We're going to use the battle tower cloning glitch to make backups in case you make a mistake. This will save your life, and we'll need this glitch more later anyway. If you've never done the glitch before, I recommend doing a practice run with some completely unrelated Pokemon. If you do it backwards, you can erase Pokemon from existence instead of cloning them, and then you're stuck. So first, we need to deposit the Pokemon we want to clone. Make sure you leave a few open spaces in your party. Next, save your game. Now, withdraw the Pokemon you want to clone. Exit the PC and go down to the multi-battle girl. Talk to her and she's going to ask you to save twice. First, she'll just have a yes, no, and you click yes. There is a noticeable pause and then a little card with your playtime pops up with another yes, no. Once you see the playtime card, turn off your game. When you load in, your party and bag will have saved. However, the PC will not have saved. So you'll have the CDOT and Plusle in your party and the original CDOT and Plusle still in the box. Cloning complete. With those two safe and sound, our next step is preparation. We'll do the easy stuff first. Get at least one palm egg berry. You can find them at the Berry Master's house. Go to the move deleter in Lily Cove and erase all of Plusle's moves but growl. Next, give Shuppet at least one HP up. It needs to have an odd amount of HP, so if it's even after one, give it another. Put those two in the box. It's C dot time. This is our first major language difference. In all non-Japanese games, you need to give CDOT 17 HP EVs and 6 attack EVs. In a Japanese game, you need to give CDOT 95 HP EVs and 8 attack EVs. The corruption we're going to perform alters the way the game reads CDOT's data. The HP and attack EVs swap values with species. So by using specific EVs, we can turn CDOT into Deoxys, Lugia, Celebi, or any one of these lovely abominations. EVs is short for effort values and they can be changed in three ways. One, eating a vitamin, which gives you 10 EVs, eating one of these berries, which removes 10 EVs, and gaining XP from specific Pokemon. Pokemon holding the EXP share also gain EVs. I recommend going to the first route because Wurmple gives one HP and Pujaina gives one attack. Super easy. Also, make sure none of your Pokemon have Pokerust while training CDOT. This doubles EV gain and will yield the wrong glitch Pokemon. This is why we made clean backups of CDOT and Plusle. It's easy to miscount or accidentally gain extra EVs in battle. Just don't rush and you'll be fine. Don't worry about level either, it doesn't matter. Once you've given the correct number of HP ups and fainted the correct number of Wurmple and Puchaina, it's time to head back to the battle tower. First, move everything out of box one and two. If you lost box one, go to deposit mode at the PC and try to deposit a party Pokemon. The first box that appears as an option is box one. We need to clone five pluses and six C dots using the method from before. Once that's done, arrange them in exactly this pattern in box two. While not necessary, this dramatically improves the odds of success. Now, in your party, get a flying Pokemon, your Shuppet, and a weak Pokemon that you can faint, and then fly to Old Dale Town and faint your weak Pokemon. Then, use Curse with Shuppet against wild Pokemon until he's at exactly 1 HP, and then put your party in this order. Fainted Pokemon, 1 HP Shuppet, flying Pokemon, and then save here in front of the grass. From this point on, everything will be glitches, so fair warning, this is where your save could start getting weird. As long as you follow the steps, you should be safe, but it's not uncommon for things like playtime, money balance, or a trainer card to get messed up. I've created save files for each language that are at this exact point in the process. They'll be linked in the description so you can follow along on emulator in a safe environment or load them onto a spare cartridge. Be warned that most bootleg copies of Emerald have issues replicating these glitches. There are some bootlegs that work, but if yours starts with something like, the save file will be loaded, this means it's a low quality reproduction and definitely won't work like an authentic copy. And with that out of the way, we're now ready to summon our first Decamark. Enter a battle and switch from Shuppet to your flying Pokemon, then run away from that battle. 
run up to the Pokemon Center, and then deposit your flying Pokemon into box three or later, and then exit the PC. Use a Palm Egg Berry on one HP Shuppet, and his HP should now drop to zero. Now go run back out to the grass and enter a battle. If successful, a Decamark should appear. Try to switch Pokemon, open a Pokemon Summary, and then close it. Now hold up for five seconds. You should hear the cursor still scrolling, and the cursor is literally flipping bits in box one and two of the PC. We only hold for five seconds, because if you hold any longer, you'll start corrupting data beyond the PC. So after five seconds, return to the battle and try to run. You should black out and appear at the Pokemon Center. So just head inside and then check box two in the PC. There should be a bunch of eggs. Most of them will be bad eggs, but there's a chance that some are hatchable eggs. You need a C.Dot egg in a nest ball. This is the correct corruption. If you get a C.Dot egg in any other ball or a plusle egg of any kind, it will not work. If you don't see a C.Dot egg in a nest ball like this, reset your game and repeat the steps up to this point. It can take 10 or more tries if you're unlucky, so be patient. Once you see the C.Dot egg in a nest ball, you can save the game. It's time to start arbitrarily executing some code. Before starting, it's important to move all Pokemon data out of boxes 11 through 14. I say Pokemon data because even if you don't see a Pokemon in a box space, sometimes the game just does this weird thing where it zeroes out the box space but leaves all the rest of the data in memory. This creates what we call ghost data and it never causes any problems in normal play because the function for depositing Pokemon always overwrites. However, when doing arbitrary code execution, that extra data in memory can cause it to crash. Thankfully, it's very easy to clear ghost data using the yellow hand. Just press select in the boxes and the hand turns yellow. Hold A on the first Pokemon in the box, move it to the last Pokemon in the box, and hit A again. You've now picked up a full box. Just drop them down in box 11, pick them up again, and repeat it in box 12, 13, and 14. From this point on, you could use the C.Egg to execute any ace code but that is old news. Instead, we're gonna use the egg to create our stable glitch Pokemon. The species is different for every language and they don't all behave exactly the same, but they fall into three main groups, stable arm, stable thumb, and stable thumb to arm bootstrap. Arm and thumb are instruction sets that the GBA processor can read and execute. For reasons beyond my comprehension, some glitch species trigger the game to read in arm mode and others in thumb. The vast majority of usable codes for Emerald for every language are located in this series of paste bin dumps from certified Emerald glitch master Slipenir. He also has a YouTube channel which deep dives into Pokemon glitches, so please show him some love. Most of Slipenir's Japanese codes are available in Thumb, and glitch species 085F is a stable Thumb species. So this is a very easy setup with a simple two-line box code. This allows the egg to hatch without crashing, although it will take a while. So the hatching animation is going to take a long time. Potentially over five seconds, so wait. Once it hatches though, you're free to go nuts. No further setup is required unless you want to create a different glitch species for running ARM codes. There are codes for both, but 085F thumb codes are much shorter and Japanese isn't exactly pleasant to type when you don't know the language. German, Spanish, and Italian Emerald have it almost as easy. They all have stable ARM species and all the ACE codes for these games are written in ARM. So, we use the C.Egg to execute a single code, which is quite long, but generates the correct species into box 10, slot 19. You'll also need to get rid of your hatched C.Egg because he'll crash your game. So, put him in the lead of your party, go to deposit mode in the PC, and then select release from there. Releasing him anywhere else will crash your game. Now, withdraw your new stable arm Pokemon, and you can execute codes from anywhere by opening its summary. Take note though that for Spanish and Italian, the glitch Pokemon is a little finicky. Opening its summary directly can cause crashes, but if you open another Pokemon summary first and head over to the contest moves page and then scroll to your glitch Pokemon, you should be fine. Also, don't ever move it with the yellow hand, it will disappear. 
Finally, we have the thumb to arm bootstrap, which is needed for French and English. Basically, these games only have stable thumb species, but the codes are written in arm. So we need to inject a bit of data in just the right place to tell the game to switch from thumb mode to arm mode. This requires two codes instead of one, but we only need the one egg as the second code is executed by the new glitch Pokemon. We also need to catch a random Pokemon and name it X male Z N six F F X C. This is the data we need to complete the bootstrap. Just keep them in your party for now. So in English, you need to make a new clone of your uncorrupted dots and put him in box 10 slot 19, and then enter this code and hatch your dots egg. This changes dots species to 40E9, which is our glitch Pokemon. French doesn't need to do anything with an uncorrupted dots and instead can just execute this code to generate 40ED in box 10 slot 19. Just also don't ever touch this one with the yellow hand, it will also disappear. After executing these codes, the box names of 11 through 14 will have changed, so don't touch them as those are needed for the next code. Now, place down little xmail zn 6 ffxc into box 10 slot 20 right next to your new glitch Pokemon, then exit the boxes and save the game. Boot the game back up and then enter this code into boxes 1 through 10 and then look at the summary of your glitch Pokemon. A certificate screen should pop, meaning the code executed. Poor little xmail zn 6 ffxc will have become a bad egg, which is good. Place him in box 14 slot 1. And with that, the setup is complete. So what I like to do now is run a simple code just to test if everything is working. I'm going to give myself the Deoxys event ticket, which is in Sleipnir's second list of codes. Working around in here can be a bit confusing, but basically you just want to look at the list of available codes and then use the find function, which is control F, and search for the code you want. From there, you read the instructions and scroll down for your desired language. In our case, we want to unlock Birth Island via Mystery Gift. And I'll be using English, but every language is available here. The instructions say to use this code inside the Pokemon Center of Mauville City, because there's a special NPC in there. Don't worry if your guy is a different color, it changes based on some data in your save file, but he functions the same no matter the color. So we type in our code, save the game, and then look at our glitch Pokemon summary, and if we see the diploma, it means the code executed. If your game crashes here, you likely mistype the code. Pay attention to blank spaces and make sure you actually type every one. Sometimes the diploma will show, but the guy won't give you the ticket. This is also a typing error somewhere in the first half of the code. Once you're successful, we can take the ticket to Lily Cove Port and permanently unlock Birth Island, which is a great test, but nothing we couldn't do before with just the glitch egg. Let me demonstrate a few more codes and show you how I like to use Ace for finding competitive shiny Pokemon. So, I've set my sights on two competitive shiny targets, Blaziken and Deoxys. We've already done the first step, which is using Ace to give ourselves access to these encounters. So, now we need to actually pick our desired nature, hidden power, and IVs. And we do this using the excellent program by Admiral Fish, Pokefinder. Pokefinder is essentially a really fancy calculator capable of simulating the game's random number generator. It uses the exact same math and inputs the game does and then spits out a list of all the potential Pokemon the game could generate and the exact frame you need to start the encounter in game to achieve that result. So both Blaziken and Deoxys in Gen 3 are capable mixed attackers. Deoxys for obvious reasons and Blaziken because its stab combination of fire fighting is always mixed in Gen 3. So I've opted for a rash nature which boosts special attack but drops special defense. We need all six IVs to be perfect, but because I want Hidden Power Ice to hit Salamence, we'll need some stats to be 30 instead of 31. Thankfully, I can just set all these filters in Pokefinder and hit search. It'll run the numbers, and of all 4.2 billion possible Pokemon, there is literally only one possible RNG state, and it's 1.2 billion frames into the game. So that covers the competitive side of things, but how do we make sure this Torchic appears shiny? Well, most people are familiar with their trainer ID number because it shows on the trainer card, but that's actually only half of your full ID. The second half is a hidden five digit number we call the secret ID, and this is actually what determines whether or not a Pokemon appears shiny. 
So we take our trainer ID, convert it to hexadecimal, and then use a programming operation known as bitwise exclusive or with the upper part and the lower part of the PID of our desired Pokemon. The result will be a four digit hex number that we then convert back into decimal. And that's the secret ID that we need to make our six IV Torchic and Deoxys shiny. And wouldn't you know it, Ace gives us the power to change our secret ID to whatever value we want with one simple code. Sleipnir has this code in his second list of codes paste bin, but admittedly working through them can be a bit tedious because you have to manually replace certain characters depending on the secret ID that you want. Thankfully, another hero of the glitch community, eShark, made a web tool that can generate ace codes for you. I even submitted a couple pull requests just for this video so that there's an easy to use change SID code for every language. All we need to do is select our language, select the code from the dropdown, and then enter the secret ID from earlier. And then the generator spits out a usable box code and we're ready to roll. Now, the annoying part about secret ID is that we can't easily verify that it actually worked correctly because it's hidden. We can at the very least go to the name raider and attempt to nickname a Pokemon just to ensure secret ID was changed. But for 100% certainty, we can use an ace code to check our secret ID, which is insanely useful for RNG manipulation in general. That code is here, read SID from Pokemon in box nine slot 27. If you just changed your SID like me, you'll need to capture a fresh Pokemon after the change because the value is actually hidden in your Pokemon's data. Because this code reads the secret ID from a captured Pokemon though, you can use it to find the secret ID of your other games by trading over a Pokemon, which is pretty cool. So we place a Pokemon in box nine, slot 27, save and execute the code. After which we pop open the trainer card and our trainer ID number will change to the secret ID. If it's correct, we can reset the game and move on. If it's incorrect, we know we made an error in either our change SID code or the code that we just used to check it, so double check for typos. Now, how on earth do we reach frame 1,229,191,224? If we just powered on our game normally, it only moves at 60 frames per second. That means we'd need to wait around 237 days just to get one shot at that six IV shiny frame. Thankfully, there are a few ways around this. The first I've demonstrated in other videos before, we use a combination of battle videos and the contest paintings to essentially make an RNG save state, reducing that wait time from 237 days to five minutes or less. However, with Ace, we can bypass all of that entirely. eShark's generator has a code called change PRNG seed, which can work exactly like a battle video, but because our Ace Pokemon is now portable, we can load that RNG state from anywhere. All we have to do is figure out an RNG state some number of frames before our desired Pokemon and then plug that into this calculator. Pokefinder makes this easy. We right click the seed from our previous search and hit generate times for seed. This gives us the nearest four digit starting point and the number of frames we'd have to wait from that state. In our case, the starting seed is 24 DC and the six IV rash frame is 56,252 RNG advances after that. So that takes us from 237 days down to 15 minutes, but we can do much better. From here, we head over to the generator tab and plug in 24 DC as the seed and then set the initial advances to 55,000. We copy the PID from that RNG state and then open the PID to IVs tool in Pokefinder and then paste in the PID. We get a couple of results, but all of them are identical except for the last one, which says XD Kahlo. We're not playing Coliseum or XD, so we know the seed value we need is 975CB734, and that's what we plug into eShark's calculator. With that code in place, every time we look at the summary of our glitch Pokemon, our game's RNG state will be exactly 1252 frames before the six IV target. A nice and easy 20 seconds. From here, our only challenge is hitting that frame perfect window. We'll need to be accurate down to the 60th of a second with our last A press. Thankfully, we get unlimited tries and each attempt takes less than 30 seconds to complete. With the help of Eon Timer, a program designed specifically for helping with RNG manipulation, we can give ourselves a six beep count in at exactly the right moment. So I set Eon Timer to Gen 3 mode and make sure the settings match my console as GBA and NDS have very slightly different frame rates. And then we enter 1252 frames. This can take some practice and patience, 
but all we need to do now is click to start the timer and open the glitch Pokemon summary at the exact same time. The timer counts down, we back out of the menu and wait on the very last A press before the Pokemon is generated. If you're insane, you could get the shiny on the first try, but more likely than not there's a slight delay and some adjustments are needed. So we'll pop open our non-shiny Torchic summary and look at the stats in nature. Pokefinder is already set up to help us find the Torchic we hit. We just have to check the show stats box so that the results show the stats of the Pokemon in game rather than the raw IVs. My first Torchic is Serious Nature, female with 19 HP. Only one result near our target can match this, which is advance number 56,183. We subtract that number from our starting point, which is 55,000, and find the difference relative to our Eon Timer target of 1252. We can then enter 1183 into the frame hit field in Eon Timer and hit update, and this will adjust the calibration automatically, and next time that delay will be accounted for. Rinse and repeat, until the planets align and like magic the game just hands you a rash, 6 IV shiny Torchic. And as a bonus, afterward you get teleported to Birch's lab, and the game prompts you to nickname your lead Pokemon, which is perfect for giving nicknames to event Pokemon like my Celebi here. Hello, Joe. The best part of all this though, is that Gift and Legendary Pokemon use the same RNG, so we can use this exact setup for Deoxys. The only difference is that Deoxys has a little cutscene before the encounter starts, so we'll need to do our delay adjustment again on the first attempt. My first one wound up being off by around 500 frames, but after one adjustment, it only took me five tries to finally pin down my shiny 6IV Deoxys. If this was your first exposure to RNG manipulation, then I hope you found it as fun and interesting as I do. I've got an entire playlist here on my channel where I cover RNG manipulation like this across all the Pokemon games, and if you made it all the way here, you're almost guaranteed to find it interesting. And as always, thank you to my members. Your continued financial support makes it possible for me to invest a bunch of time and energy into long, creative videos like this, and I hope you enjoyed it. I really do, and if you want to continue supporting me, consider hitting the join button down below to become a channel member for only $4.99 a month. This has been Papa Jefe. I will see you all soon. Love y'all. Peace.